I'm Ron Duncan Hart of the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series, and I'd like to welcome the hundreds of you who are joining us from across the United States and Canada to the UK, Israel, and beyond. Today's program on Oppenheimer and Jewish ethics is with two rabbis, Rabbi Dr. Jack Schlachter and Rabbi Dr. Raphael Zarum, who are both physicists and who understand the ethical dilemmas that Oppenheimer faced. J. Robert Oppenheimer loved New Mexico. He owned a ranch here and lived in the state for many years. He recommended Los Alamos for the location of the Manhattan Project. And it is appropriate that we take this in-depth look at him, his Jewishness and his ethical dilemma about the militarization of his scientific work. Atomic energy was a paradigm altering scientific technological innovation. And in recent years, we've had a series of such innovations from the digital age, with the computers and all of that, smartphones, and now artificial intelligence. Each of these has brought both positive and negative effects. And we have to ask ourselves, how do we integrate such paradigm shifting events within our ethical worlds? It's appropriate that we talk about Oppenheimer now because last week was the 78th anniversary of the bombing of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, events that we cannot forget. Another matter of importance to us today is the fact that after World War II, Oppenheimer was railroaded, uh, in the terms of some, out of the poly policy positions um, on nuclear energy in our country, and his security clearance was revoked, uh, partly because of his opposition to the militarization of nuclear energy. He was going against the trend of what people wanted to do, and he was simply pushed aside. Recently, Energy Secretary Jennifer Granholm restored Oppenheimer's security clearance retroactively to clear his name. I would like to introduce the two rabbis who lead our discussion today. Rabbi Dr. Jack Schlachter is the former head of the theoretical division of Los Alamos National Laboratory, which was Oppenheimer's old position at one point. Rabbi Schlechter has also had positions with the Brookhaven National Laboratory in New York and the Atomic Energy Agency and the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty Organization, both in Vienna, Austria. He is the rabbi of Hamakon Congregation here in Santa Fe, and he has served as visiting rabbi for congregations from Vienna to New York and Beijing. Rabbi Dr. Raphael Zarum comes to us from the United Kingdom, where he is the Dean and Rabbi Sachs Chair of Modern Jewish Thought at the London School of Jewish Studies. He earned a PhD in theoret theoretical physics before becoming a rabbi. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs, the Chief Rabbi of the British Commonwealth, was his mentor. Rabbi Zarum is an intellectual leader, uh, interna inter international lecturer, and an author with a passion for teaching traditional Jewish texts and exploring innovative educational programming. It is my pleasure to welcome the two of you to the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, the format will be for each of you to make an initial statement of Oppenheimer, his Jewishness, and ethical concerns before we go into the discussion of these matters. Uh, Dr. Schlechter, would you go first and give us your take on these issues? So I wanted to begin my remarks by thanking you, Ron, for, uh, as always, your impeccable uh, assistance and uh, guidance on these uh, le as part of this lecture series. It's really a pleasure to participate. And it's also an honor for me to participate in this particular dialogue with Rabbi Raphael Zaram. Um, 
I wanted to just share a few slides at the beginning here to set the stage. Uh, I've been quite interested, largely as a result of the recent movie, uh, to learn more about Oppenheimer and uh, Jewish ethics. So uh, this is a wonderful opportunity to share some of what I've learned. Um, I'm actually going to uh, draw some contrasts between Oppenheimer, whom you see on the left here, and uh, sort of his nemesis, if you've seen the movie, uh, Louis Strauss. He pronounced his name Strauss. That was allegedly the Southern pronunciation of what looks like Strauss. Um, and you see the two of them depicted here. And I really want to focus on the different nature of their Jewishness. And I think this was actually a contributor to the conflict between these two individuals. Um, a little bit about Oppenheimer's background. His father, Julius, came to the United States as a teenager from Germany in 1888. And uh, it's valuable to know the context of what was happening with Judaism at that time. Uh, Moses Mendelssohn, whom you likely know, was the one who really brought Judaism into the modern era, and he developed the concept of Judaism not as a people, but as a religion. And his idea was that Jews in Germany would be proud Germans. They would be German citizens. They just happened to be German citizens who worshipped in synagogues rather than in churches. Uh, but despite his interest in emancipating the Jewish people, if you will, uh, the Germans were not so accepting. And so many German Jews emigrated to the United States in the mid 19th century because they were seeking the freedom and equality in the United States that they failed to achieve in Germany. And Oppenheimer's father was among that group coming to the United States in 1888. Here in the United States, Oppenheimer's father felt ethnically and culturally Jewish, but the family belonged to no synagogue, and Judaism played virtually no role in the Oppenheimer household. Um, J. Robert Oppenheimer himself grew up, what I would think you might say was uneasy about his Jewishness. Uh, his friend and uh, the famous physicist I. I. Rabi, who would win the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1944, said of Oppenheimer that Oppenheimer was Jewish, but he wished he weren't. And I think we have the elements of the stereotype or character, if you will, of the self-hating Jew. Now, for this story, uh, you can see that maybe iconically with this symbol associated with J. Robert Oppenheimer. And I say this somewhat jokingly, but we, we think of the pork pie hat as the icon of J. Robert Oppenheimer. And clearly, pork pie just seems like that uh, trying to distance oneself from one's Jewishness. Um, more... Uh, legitimately though let me tell you a little bit about the story of temple emmanuel in new york city because this actually plays an important role in the story of oppenheimer's upbringing and also of his nemesis straws uh and and i just wanted to share with you a little bit about temple emmanuel so i said that uh german jewish uh emigration occurred starting in the mid 19th century and in fact a group of i believe like 33 jews according to the temple emmanuel website began worship services in a loft in the lower east side of new york city you see the 1800s um the german jews in new york city gained some affluence and subsequently built the building in the lower left this moorish uh, style synagogue and then in the early 1920s they built the massive structure that you see that is there today on fifth avenue in new york city temple emmanuel um the uh synagogue temple emmanuel brought over to the united states from germany the adler family in particular samuel adler with his 
family, including his young son, Felix. I think Felix might have been uh, six years old at the time the family came to the United States. And Samuel came over to accept the appointment as the rabbi at Temple Emmanuel. Um, it was thought by many that Felix, his son, would grow to succeed the father as the rabbi at Temple Emmanuel uh, in later years. And so Felix was educated in Europe, in Germany. He received his PhD, as you see, from Heidelberg. He was influenced not only by Kant, but also by Karl Marx. Uh, and that plays a role in, uh, in the subsequent history of Felix Adler. Felix uh, came back to the United States at the age of 23, and he gave his first sermon at Temple Emmanuel with the idea that he was being groomed to be the rabbi to replace his father eventually. However, uh, things did not go so well. Felix had adopted the uh, concept of Judaism as a universal religion of morality for all of humankind. He tried to develop a solution to the challenge of how to be a good Jew and a good American when one did not believe in any elements of the creed. And in fact, he promoted this idea of um, Judaism without ritual or creed um, and uh, his sermon in 1874 never mentioned God. Well, this did not sit well with the bulk of the Temple Emmanuel congregation, and it was quite clear that Felix was never going to become the rabbi of Temple Emmanuel. He broke off, along with some congregants, and created what was called the Society of Ethical Culture. Um, it was really a non-religion, if you will, but it was made up largely of Jews. Um, this uh, Society of Ethical Culture was very important to the Oppenheimer family. Uh, J. Robert Oppenheimer's father, Julius Oppenheimer, was a trustee of the Ethical Culture Society, and Felix Adler officiated at the wedding ceremony for Julius and Ella, J. Robert Oppenheimer's parents. So clearly, uh, ethical culture was important in the upbringing of J. Robert Oppenheimer, and in fact, the Ethical uh, Culture Society had an ethical culture school associated with it, and J. Robert Robert Oppenheimer was educated in that ethical culture school. Now, um, according to Ray Monk in his biography of Oppenheimer, uh, the physicist I. I. Robbie, whom I mentioned earlier, thought that what prevented Oppenheimer from being fully integrated was his denial of a centrally important part of himself, namely his Jewishness. Another physicist, Felix Bloch, who also went on to win the Nobel Prize in Physics, another Jewish physicist, said that Oppenheimer tried to act as if he were not a Jew, and he succeeded well because he was a good actor. So if we want to talk a little bit about Oppenheimer's Jewishness, um, first of all, uh, you have this conflict um, uh, and another example of that is I. I. Rabi saying that when Rabi would see Jews, even though Rabi himself was not a practicing Jew, but when he would see Jews, he that would elicit the statement, "These are my people." And Rabi felt that Oppenheimer would never in, in, be in a situation where he would look at Jews and say, "These are my people." Um, what has been said is that the sense in which Oppenheimer was Jewish, uh, the sense in which he did and did not come from and belong to a Jewish community, is far more complicated. And as Rabi has perceptively noted, uh, it's crucial in understanding the fragility of Oppenheimer's sense of identity. Now we do see some examples of Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer's Judaism. Uh, early on, when the Nazis came to power in Germany, Oppenheimer, who was then a professor at Berkeley, did earmark some of his salary to support the emigration of some Jewish scientists from Germany. I think what was important not was not just that they were Jewish, but that they were scientists. And of course, they were being persecuted because they were Jewish. But I think maybe what was important for Oppenheimer was the fact that they were fellow scientists. Um, there is evidence that Oppenheimer sponsored his aunt and cousin to emigrate from Nazi Germany and did assist them financially for many years. Uh, you see that it says that uh, at the clearance hearing in 1954, uh, Oppenheimer said that he had developed a smoldering fury 
jury about the treatment of Jews in Germany in late 1936, but this was said in 1954. I don't know exactly what the situation was like at the time. And then I will mention that Oppenheimer himself experienced some anti-Semitism. Um, he was the most famous physicist in the country after World War II and was being given many offers to come to universities. And despite all this, um, Milliken, the president of Caltech at the time, was concerned that maybe there were already enough Jews on the faculty and that maybe Oppenheimer uh, would not fit in so well uh, at Caltech. Uh, kind of a sad statement. Um, I will mention, by the way, that um, the selection of Los Alamos as the site for the Manhattan Project uh, intellect, if you will, um, came about because Oppenheimer knew of New Mexico from his uh, sojourns starting as a late teenager. But one of the appeals of the Southwest of the United States was that Oppenheimer could escape the German Jewish community in which he was embedded in New York. So you see this evidence of Oppenheimer trying to flee from his Judaism. Um, Ray Monk, whom I mentioned earlier, says in his biography that Oppenheimer cannot be understood without taking into to account the importance of his deeply felt desire to overcome the sense of being an outsider that he inherited from his German Jewish background. Um, Strauss, on the other hand, uh, demonstrates many things that show his commitment to his Judaism. And you see that uh, as early as 1918, as a relatively young individual in his 20s, he was assisting Herbert Hoover, who was in charge of relief efforts for communities that had been suffering from World War I. And Strauss pushed hard to help out Jews, even though Hoover himself was prejudiced against Jews. Um, you see that he served as the president of Temple Emmanuel for a decade from 1938 to 1948. He tried ransoming Jews uh, using his own money uh, and thought of himself as an American of Jewish religion. Strauss tried very hard to get the United States to accept more refugees from Nazi Germany. And he really was focused on Jews, not on Jewish scientists. Um, Strauss is the one on the right in this photograph. That's a photograph of the Atomic Energy Commission when it was first established in the late 1940s. And it's very appropriate that Strauss is, first of all, on the right. He was a very right-leaning conservative political individual, but also he's a little bit away from the other four. And there were several votes of the Atomic Energy Commission where it was four against one and Strauss was the lone dissenter. Often those were things having to do with security. Later on in 1953, I believe, Strauss became the chairman of the committee. And that's when things went south with uh, his relationship with Oppenheimer. And, and here you see him being sworn in to be the interim Secretary of Commerce with Dwight Eisenhower as the president, but Strauss was not confirmed by the Senate. And in part, that's because people were still angry about the role that he played in the revocation of Oppenheimer's security clearance. I think there were other issues at play as well. So I'm just going to close, I think, um, with a positive thing about Strauss, which is very particular to Los Alamos. And I actually serve as the rabbi in Los Alamos as well right now, and I had served for many years in that role. This is a letter that I found in the archives of the Jewish community in Los Alamos. Um, and it's a letter after about two months after the death of Admiral Strauss. And it's a letter to his widow or to his family. And it says the Los Alamos Jewish Center was deeply saddened to hear of the recent passing of Admiral Strauss in appreciation for his early and enthusiastic support of our group, the Los Alamos Jewish Center. We are dedicating a series of books uh, in the center library as a fitting memorial to a great friend of the community. What he did, what Strauss did, was help the Jewish Center in Los Alamos secure a loan at zero interest so they could build the building that we currently use. So this is an individual who used his influence to help Jews. Um, I'm just gonna close with this picture of the two individuals, Oppenheimer and Strauss, 
And to say that one might view this as a clash between ethical humanism on the Oppenheimer side that comes out of the Felix Adler school uh, and ethical humanism was a major part of that versus ethical monotheism, which you might associate with reform Judaism and, um, and Temple Emmanuel and Admiral Strauss. So what I will um, say in conclusion to my remarks is that there's a wonderful book I recommend called um, Big Questions, Brief Answers. You may be familiar with this book, Rafi, um, but if you go to question number 12 in this book, question number 12 says, what do I do if I really don't like being Jewish? And I think had Oppenheimer read that chapter and understood that being Jewish is something that we can be proud of as Strauss was, um, and we can do that despite living in a world where there is anti-Semitism. I think Oppenheimer might have been a more uh, integrated individual. So thank you for the opportunity to share some remarks. That. Thank you so much, Rabbi Jack. So interesting to hear a lot about um, about Oppenheimer and the Jewish part of it, and uh, and uh, and the Strauss. Strauss. Let's let, 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 let's call him by his name. All right. Try to, as you say, make himself feel not Jewish by calling it Strauss, but it's Strauss. And and the letters to, from the community is fascinating. So it's a really interesting to be involved with people directly connected to the history of it. And again, uh, let me add my thanks to Ron for organizing this program and so many other programs. You do so much for the Jewish community there, and it has a global impact with people learning around the world. So appreciate that, Ron. And uh, so uh, I'm going to talk about two different things. I'm going to talk about uh, Jewish science and collective punishment or collective responsibility. And those are two things that I thought about as a result of watching the Oppenheimer movie, um, uh, which was fascinating, by the way. I'm a big fan of the director. He was actually the year above me in a university, University College London. He ran the Film Society, uh, which I used to go to. Uh, so um, it's, a, it's a really wonderful, thoughtful movie. And it's a movie of ideas. It tells the history. It's involved in the politics of science. Um, but it's really ultimately a movie about ideas. And what interests me uh, in my approach as a rabbi is the issue of ideas. And there's, there's, a, there's a moment in the movie, um, and it's a little bit of a spoiler for those who haven't seen it, but I mean, obviously, there's a bomb. I think you probably know that. But there's a moment in the movie where they're very nervous that the uh, German war effort is ahead and that they're going to be able to make an atomic bomb before Los Alamos, uh, being led by the greatest scientist of the world at the time, Heisenberg, in Germany. And at one point, Oppenheimer says, and this is based on truth, that it's, it, it, they're going to fall behind. And, and um, he's asked why, and he says, because of anti-Semitism. And they say to him, why is that? He says, because they reject Jewish science. Now, this phrase Jewish science is an interesting one. Okay, It's not referring to uh, Wissenschaft Juden, which was the kind of modern study of Judaism as a subject, as a scientific subject. It's not what they mean. It was the uh, Jewish science was a kind of approach of the Nazis that... Um, the investigation of science wasn't a neutral uh, process and that by Jews doing it, 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 it affected it in some way, it sullied it in some ways. And that meant two things, that, they, um, that, uh, that, that the Nazis wanted to deprive German physics of, of some of its most valuable researchers and not have so many Jews involved in science. And also that certain kinds of science done by Einstein was a great example and therefore quantum mechanics were the wrong way of thinking. They were Jewish thinking and therefore were evil and wrong and shouldn't be done. And these two things, uh, Oppenheimer was basically arguing, well, in an approach in the movie, definitely, that they, they wouldn't use Jewish science, scientists as much, and they wouldn't value the way Jewish Jews thought, as if there was a kind of Jewish way of thinking, and that's why they would lose. And that, that really fascinated me, um, because it's about this issue of what is the Jewish perspective on something, and... What was Oppenheimer, as Jack said very interestingly, doing, struggling with his identity as a Jew? What was it? Now, I don't know, but, and I'd love to ask Jack this and maybe discuss this, but as a person that studied science, undergraduate and then a PhD, um, it's a very different approach to the world. In science, there is no preconceived assumptions. There is just research and experimentation and deduction. 
And we do that, and from that, we work out how we understand the world. It's a universalist approach. The whole point of a, an equation of a theory is that it's always applicable, that experiment will always repeat, and it's a, tr it's a universal truth. Whereas Judaism is a particularist faith of a particular history, and they're very, very different things. And I can imagine that someone who was not brought up particularly Jewish and was in love with physics, and let's be clear, those scientists the, the, the uh, developments of physics in the early 20th century with relativity and quantum mechanics were magnificent. And as a result, scientists were no doubt loved up with their understanding of science. I, when I was in university, and I'm sure my Jack was as well, there's a moment you go where you just think it's amazing, where you can predict the nature of the world through equations. I remember very clear by Jack when I was uh, doing my... Uh, my undergraduate degree, and we were learning about uh, moments and the uh, unstable equilibriums of different dynamics. And our tutor showed us the mathematics and said, this object, which he had an interesting revolving object, has to obey the laws we've just derived. And it did. And I was fascinated that we could actually do those things. So my feeling is that scientists who believed in this had difficulty with the idea of a traditional faith. And Einstein, who we know and very important in this time, didn't believe in a particular God. He, he believed in a kind of universal origin of mystery which is could be called could be termed god but not a particular one and that that that's the kind of universalist's faith um but oppenheimer with his alternative uh ethical cultural society that he'd follow to an extent or his way of looking at things uh probably rejected that as well and just wanted to see everything through scientific eyes and therefore was very rejectionist of of, of those things and saw it very differently so that's why i think he's very disconnected from his from his uh from his judaism uh uh it's interesting by the way that they accuse him of being a communist and and that, that again that relates partly to his idealism um there were many jews who got involved in communism and uh, there's a very interesting article by winston churchill actually which he wrote in the jewish newspaper in the uk about him loving jews but very nervous about communist jews uh which is an interesting uh, interesting issue so the first thing i want to talk about was about jewish science and that was represented in the movie and a good movie will do a whole philosophical issue through just one line i think that's what they do but they're addressing that issue of what was jewish science and what did that mean and the fact that oppenheimer was aware of it in the movie is kind of showing his jewishness to one extent and not necessarily feeling it personally but understanding its role within the culture of the time and then obviously jews who don't connect to their religion always get affected by anti-semitism that's the nature because you, you can't if, you're, if you've got a basic moral sense, you're always going to feel connected to that. And therefore, when Jew, uh, Jewish scientists have difficulty getting out of Europe, he cares about that and so on. So that's the, the first issue. The second one, which for me is the, the most fundamental moral issue, is the idea of collective punishment, which is what the atom bomb is all about. Now, they truly believed when they were, were building this, if they could build it, that it would stop the war. And it would stop the war against the Nazis and reduce the loss of life. But they always knew that if they could do it, wherever they dropped it, wherever they dropped it in Germany, wherever they'd done it, even if it was the middle of the front, the, the, the width and the spread of the bomb would have indiscriminately killed thousands of people, definitely civilians as well. And so you have a fundamental question of collective responsibility. Is that morally right to do that? And if it's a deterrent that might stop the war, does that justify it? And this is the classic moral question. Are you allowed to kill many who are, who are not directly involved in order to achieve um, some kind of deterrent process. Um, uh, it's, 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 a, it's an issue in all warfare that we do, but when you've got a bomb of this size, it's not dropped in a particular place. Its spread is so large, it's always going to um, kill um, much wider than its direct target. The idea of a target is even that, kind of a bit simplistic in this sense. And therefore, it's a fundamental moral question. So... And just in a, a few minutes, we can discuss it more later. I've, I've written a lot about this, which is that, you know, does Judaism believe in collective punishment? And you could argue in the Torah that it does. When God wants to destroy the city of Sodom and Gomorrah, he's willing to, uh, he says, if there are a few righteous people there, he says to Abraham, that might turn it around. But if they're not, I'm going to I'm going to destroy it all. And when he destroys the Egyptians, um, when they all drown in the sea, that's all of them. It's a collective story. And when they go to the land of Israel, he says, wipe out the uh, nations of Amalek and the seven Noachide nations. So there's a clear implication in the Torah that you can do collective uh, punishment. Having said that, all the examples I gave were, were demanded by God, were commanded by God. Now, that's not comparable because 
if God's doing it, we can imagine that would be ethical because God would define ethics and there could be a moral reason for doing it. So I could say that, true, if God tells you to do a collective punishment, then that's acceptable for other moral reasons. God might know that those people are deserving of punishment. But can a human choose to punish? Are they allowed to do that? And if you look carefully in the Torah, it seems that that is challenged. So the, the classic verse about this is in Deuteronomy, where it says, Ish becheto yamutu, each person according to their own sin will die and that you can't punish someone else as a result of that. And the Talmud actually discusses this. The Talmud actually says, the Gemara, that, that originally in the Torah, possibly collective punishment was allowed, but um, Ezekiel comes along and quotes this verse from Deuteronomy and says the same idea, that uh, a person will die only in the sin that they do, and that you're not allowed to do collective punishment. And that was the uh, the kind of position, it seems, in the Torah, which would argue against um, being able to drop a bomb in, in any way to do this. Is it morally right to do that, even if it saves more lives after? And I'll just end with a tantalizing story in the Bible, which for me really typifies this issue and what Oppenheim was trying to achieve. And in fact, the whole team in terms of creating this uh, this atom bomb. And it's the story of King David, who we, we like to see as this wonderful hero, the writer of the Book of Psalms, or many of them who conquers Israel and uh, creates a huge, a huge country, which hands on to his son, Solomon. But if you look at the second book of Samuel, chapter eight, it's after David has uh, conquered a, a bunch of nations around him in order to secure his kingdom. And it, it writes about, in the beginning of chapter eight, the war with Moab, the war with Moab. And it says the most amazing thing. It says that um, after he conquered Moab and they, they'd won the battle, he then lined up his sol the soldiers of Moab it's in chapter A of second book of Samuel. <clears throat> we don't know exact numbers. It probably been 10 to 15,000 soldiers. He lined them up and had a piece of string to measure one third of them and then put to death a third of the soldiers. This is after the battle. There's a horrific thing. And when you read that, it's quite shocking. How could King David do that? And you look at the commentaries and one says that actually what had happened is, is that when King David was running away from King Saul, when he was on, on the run, um, when he was younger, that um, he'd asked for the Moabites to hide his parents. And the Moabites originally had looked after King David's parents, but then they'd murdered them and assassinated them. And to punish them, David is now killing a third of their soldiers. But that's collective punishment. It's completely unacceptable. How can that be? So I looked at other commentaries and the Zohar, a Kabbalistic text, is very interesting. The Kabbalist, it's a very funny answer, and then you might find it interesting about Jack. The Zohar says, ah, David had, um, it was a divine intervention, and God determined that everyone that David killed actually deserved to die, that they had done immoral acts themselves, and they deserved to die. Now, even though that's quite a wild text coming from the Zohar, what's interesting is, the Zohar would have known about the, uh, the Zohar is much later in the Talmud, about this Tal Talmudic interpretation that David was doing, was actually killing these people to, um, to get back at um, them for killing his parents. And my argument is the Zohar might have thought that's not compelling enough. That's collective punishment. That's not moral. The only thing that makes it moral, whether it's true or not, or by Jack is a separate issue. But for the Zohar, they can't imagine David doing it because collective pun punishment is wrong. The only thing that could justify would be a divine act that would show it was the right thing to do. Otherwise, it wouldn't have been. So, again, this reinforces the basic Jewish approach. And there are other sources, but again, we're short on time, that collective punishment is not acceptable. That you always have to focus on punish people that deserve the action and not others along. And you might say, well, what, what, what could they have done? Um, they had to drop the bomb to prove they could do it, to stop the war. And there's a big debate, as we know, uh, I'll finish with this, whether whether it was needed or necessary uh, and whether whether the Japanese would continue to fight. But there is the possibility of also dropping one bomb um, uh, and having making sure that it works before you before you do it, <laughs> before, before you bring reporters in. But having a second one in a very public place with reporters from all over the world to prove we can do this. And then threatening to do it as a deterrent, but actually doing it as a very challenging moral question. And once we've opened up the, the door to that, the world changes. And that's what Oppenheimer realized, that famous line um, from Bhagavad, uh, Bhagavad Gita, where he says, I become death, destroyer of worlds. Right? Oppenheimer realized the world changed with what they did, and they couldn't put the genie back in the bottle. And that led later to the hydrogen bomb and a different way of looking at the world. So the moral challenges became huge as a result of this, and the ethical question stands. Um, Oppenheimer regretted doing it 
and not regretted. And there's, it's actually complicated. I've heard so many different views about this. He, he celebrated that he achieved it, but regretted some of the moral aspects of it. And for me, Jack, that's his Judaism kind of like it. That moral sense of this innate, there must be, it's too shocking. We don't deserve to have this. Um, is for me his, uh, his Jewishness in, in, a, in a kind of ethical sense coming back in. So those are the two things I wanted to talk about, Jewish science and collective punishment. Thank you. If I can just come in here and follow up a, a bit on uh, what uh, Rabbi Rafi was just saying. Um, I, I have a quote when uh, Oppenheimer was speaking to the American Philosophical Society. He said, in quote, we have made a thing a most terrible weapon that has altered abruptly and profoundly the nature of the world. A thing that by all standards of the world we grew up in is an evil thing. And by so doing, we have raised again the question of whether science is good for man. Can you, can you, can you comment on that? Yeah, yes, it's a, it's a great question. Is science moral or immoral? So for me, and I'd love to hear what my Jack thinks about this, Science in the process of research is amoral. It is not about that. It's the ability to work something out. The choice of what to do with that knowledge is something else. That's for ethics to do. And the decision of dropping the bomb was nothing to do with Oppenheimer. True, if he hadn't made it, they couldn't do it. But that's a separate issue from the research. So a science in itself is amoral. And it, it, I mean, it's another way of looking at nuclear energy, by the way. Nuclear energy. Is, is, is nuclear energy good or bad? Well, if you control it, it can it can support uh, uh, nuclear power stations, can support uh, energy of an entire civilization as a, as a gift to society. But uncontrolled with the rods out, then you have nuclear power. So nuclear energy isn't essentially good or bad, but unfettered, uncontrolled, it ends up being dangerous. And interestingly, is one Jewish idea, Ron, is that the Jewish idea, I'm sure you know, is that we have an evil and a good inclination, a yetzah hatov and a yetzah hara, an inclination to do good, an inclination to do bad. But uh, as a child, you learn these kind of little childish ideas of, you know, like a devil and an angel on your shoulder, do good or do bad, you know. Um, but that's not how Judaism looks at it. If you look at it very in the way that Palmer talks about it, the evil inclination isn't actually evil. The evil inclination is raw energy uncontrolled. The Talmud says without the evil inclination, you wouldn't get married, you wouldn't have a job, you wouldn't do anything because it's the raw ability to create, to build science, whatever it is. The Yetzirah Tov is the reins that controls that energy. So it's similar to the way I talked about nuclear energy as well. So it's not that science is innately good or bad. It's what you do with it and how you morally act towards it. And that's the role of the ethicists. And I would argue religious leaders as well. Um, in England, sometimes ethic, ethical groups uh, bring in, uh, I'm involved with artificial intelligence uh, debates, and the researchers will bring in um, ethicists and rabbis and, and imams and priests to talk about the moral responsibilities that go with it. But as I say, science inherently isn't good or bad. It's just a, a way of understanding our world. What we do with it is where the ethics comes in. Yeah, my thank you. Uh, my take is maybe slightly different, but most Mostly the same. I think you're right that, um, or at least my perspective is also that science is somewhat neutral, uh, and then it's how the science is used. I have sometimes thought about some research, though, that I'd rather people not do. Um, and doing the research in and of itself is, uh, is neutral. But for example, doing research to determine whether there are intelligence differences for people from different racial backgrounds, for example. I'm mm -hmm. not sure I want that research done because I can't see a good use that that would get put to down the road. So I can kind of anticipate that that research has a higher probability of being used in an unethical way than some other research. Uh, but in general, I agree with you that uh, that research in and of itself is fairly neutral. Um, but at least with some research, we should be thinking down the road, how might this research ultimately be used? Um, uh, the other thought that comes to my mind is that um, what you talked about, Rafi, with uh, having rabbis and ethicists uh, partnering with science early on rather than late in the game. That to me is a very wise approach. I think scientists too often now 
are so specialized that they really have to devote their energy to becoming the best researchers they can be. And there are parts of their education that are probably left somewhat uh, less developed shall we say. And so partnering, I think, with people who have focused on some of these other issues, I think is a brilliant idea. I'm really glad to hear that that's something that you're involved in. And it's the kind of thing that we should probably be encouraging even more. Absolutely. I mean, for me, you know, control of government or, or, or religion or ethics on scientists, it, you'll end up with a kind of fight. And what it should be is a partnership. My teacher at my Sachs, his book about religion and science is called The Great Partnership. It's not about one or they're both two ways of understanding the world and they need to work together. Um, and interestingly, if you look at the uh, debates about uh, um, the dangers of social media and how it's gone wrong, the people leading the charge are often people who are uh, researchers or um, uh, computer geeks who very early on were very involved in the development of social media. And they're the ones who are realizing this is unhealthy for society. Uh, they weren't given a moral compass when they were younger. They've now seen what they've done does. The person who invented like doom, uh, in, infinite scrolling feels very bad about it. And they're, and they're, you know, and they're the ones who are shouting loudly about the dangers of social media and artificial intelligence and so on. But so my belief is that we should teach everybody scientists everybody in school whether religious or not to have a moral compass of responsibility and understand the consequences of the choices they are making that, that, that they are doing and i think having a moral compass is fundamental to our society and and, and that will decide um these kind of issues uh, and and i think that um having researchers pause periodically to think about the longer term consequences of their work is valuable. My understanding is that during the Manhattan Project, for the first fraction, significant fraction of the war uh, of the Manhattan Project, um, the enemy was Germany. And it was very clear that there was a race to develop a bomb before the Nazis had a bomb. And I think Everybody is of the opinion that had the Nazis gotten to an atomic bomb first, it would have been a very bad thing. Uh, oh, and absolutely. Yeah. And if you're, and there were a lot of Jewish scientists in Los Alamos, and they, by, by 1940, knew what was happening to the Jews, what Hitler had written about the Jews for a long time, and they took it personally. And they knew full well they wanted to destroy it. And they had no qualms of dropping a bomb, an atomic bomb in their mind, on Germany because they saw the country as all supporting Hitler. And it's a great question, by the way. Uh, there's a book by Goldhagen years ago, 94, right? Hitler's Willing Executioners, that actually an argument that the whole of society was anti Semitic and was morally corrupt and had a right to die. It's a great question. Do we, can we judge a society as a whole? is again that collective punishment or do we say if they voted in that person and acquiesced to what's going on they are guilty to an extent it's, it's a great moral question to ask about our society um you know are they are they complicit by by virtue of having voted from this person so the issue would happen with putin in russia as well today right. um right. Uh, it, it, uh, it, um, uh, i'm in that way and that's why i can imagine them seeing to be willing to drop this bomb but i believe and i don't know again this is my projection jack but what watching the movie is when you're involved in the science, you know, my PhD took six and a half years. When you're doing the science, you're not considering the consequences or, or even what's for dinner. You're in the science. Can I do it? And I think Oppenheimer was so obsessed with the, the with doing it from his scientific background, from the being compelled to the responsibilities that he had, that that probably consumed him more than anything else. And only after the project was done and after it wasn't really in his hands and after it was real, then the moral questions I would have thought flooded his mind and would change him. And I, I really believe it. It's, it. I'm putting it down to just that. When you're really focused on something, you don't have time to think about the issue. You, it's a war. Uh, it's a war for the future of the world, whether we'll survive. And yes, by the time they did it, Germany had surrendered. It was about Japan. But nevertheless, they were, they'd were done the whole process. Only after it was all done and he even saw it, then the moral questions uh, come in. Um, and, and that's interesting. There's a very interesting character who probably doesn't get as much attention as he should, but Sir Joseph Rotblot uh, was a Jewish scientist who was uh, in Los Alamos during the Manhattan Project period. And when he found out that, uh, when it was clear to him that Nazi Germany was no longer the enemy, uh, he quit the project. And there really was no process for 
what do you do if you decide you want to leave Los Alamos in the middle of right. the project? Right. That, was, right. that paperwork had not been developed. Um, right. And it was quite complicated for him to leave. He was, I believe he was followed by the FBI. And, you know, this was a really serious thing. But right. very few scientists stopped and said, wait a minute, the, the rules have changed. When I entered this project, the Nazis were the enemy. Now somehow things have changed. And have I reconsidered what it is that I'm doing? I think yeah. he was very much the exception. Right. And uh, one more thing I want to tell you before we go, and we have to take some questions as well. Bobby Jack. Another angle I was thinking about this, I wanted to mention, when you talked about, you know, is it, you know, we can do this research, but should we? What's going to happen down the line? And I thought about the, uh, I always think of a kind of religious perspective on this. I thought about the fact that the book, which the film is based on, it was called American Prometheus. Prometheus, famous, you know, Greek, uh, who, who stole the fire from the gods, the ability, uh, which, and the, the fire, by the way, being hidden by the gods. They didn't want humankind to have this power. And Prometheus steals it for humankind. And I was comparing that to the Garden of Eden. Because the origin, because the, stealing fire is not just fire itself, it's the knowledge to make fire or knowledge itself. And in the Torah, the origin of knowledge is eating from the tree of good and evil. Now, God tells Adam not to have that. And in a way, it's stolen as well. Eve steals it from the tree, right? And then Adam has it as well. But when you look at the commentaries, the question you have to ask is, why did God create a tree with food in it and then tell them, don't eat it? It's a setup. Clearly, you're meant to. So a lot of the Hasidic commentaries say he was meant, they were meant to get knowledge. They were meant to eat from the tree, but not yet. It was meant to be the sixth day of creation. They were meant to take the fruit from the tree, turn it into wine, because it wasn't an apple. That's a much later idea. The word for good and evil, evil in, in, in Latin is mullum, which is the same word for evil. So they thought it was an apple. Apples aren't indigenous to anywhere in the region. It definitely wasn't an apple. There's a few theories what it was. None of them were an apple from the from Talmud. But one is that it was it was vine, a vine, wine. And the aim was to make wine from this. this. And when Shabbat came in on Friday night to make a kiddush, to sanctify the wine, the knowledge, and then drink it. In other words, the knowledge of the gods, or for us, God, is not, it is given to humankind. It's very different to the Greek philosophy. Greek, it's stolen. It's something dangerous. We shouldn't really have, or we're going to screw it up. In Judaism, there's an empowerment. Knowledge was always meant for humankind, but humans will might screw it up and grab at it and not understand what they have, and that kicks them out of the Garden of Eden. But if they sanctify it, if they understand the knowledge, if they respect it and use it for good, making wine for moral, then God wants them to have it, and that's part of the purpose of creation. So you've got two very different philosophical approaches to scientific investigation. The Promethean fire is dangerous. It's what are you going to do with it? The Jewish one is be responsible. Absolutely. And you could do terrible things, but it was always meant for you. And that's very interesting for me when I think about what um, uh, the, the, the scientific endeavor. That, that's a beautiful teaching. I will say that um, in the longer version of the talk that I gave about Oppenheimer and uh, his nemesis, uh, I showed a picture of Leo Strauss before showing Lewis. And um, Leo Strauss has this whole thing about Athens and Jerusalem. Right. And, and you're absolutely right. It's not the same thing. We don't have the same attitude about knowledge. Right. Absolutely. We have a number of questions that have come up. And if we can uh, begin to address some of these, Stephen Levy says, can the dropping of the bomb be viewed as a variation of the dilemma of the trolley? Many more people would have died in an allied invasion of mainland. Japan. So, so I, I could do that very briefly. Absolutely. In fact, there's a paper by uh, Masahiro Morika in 2017, the in the Journal of Philosophy of Life, which is called The Trolley Problem and the Dropping of the Atomic Bombs. So absolutely. They're philosophically connected. Absolutely. One's theoretical and one's uh, very, very real. You, you may want to take a minute and just to make sure people know what the trolley situation is. Uh, I mean, I'm familiar with it, but it might help for everybody to hear that. Oh, it's, it's the, yeah, yeah, it's the, the simple idea that there's a, it's a philosophical question that uh, moral philosophy always asks about uh, a driver of a train and he's heading down the track and he can see that uh, there's, there's, um, there's um, uh, five people in front of him and he can swerve away from those five people and go on another track, but there's another person on that track. So by swerving, he's definitely going to kill this other one instead. And is he allowed to make a moral choice of how many he's going to kill in that process? 
Um, if you've seen the series, The Good Place, did you get to see that, Jet Rabbi Jack? On, on Netflix, The Good Place is brilliant. It's got great philosophical issues, but they are actually do the trope from a number of times, number of times in the process. But it's a great series that analyzes lots of uh, more philosophical di uh, dilemmas. But that's absolutely, so it's a related question. Really, Schwartz asks, isn't the question of nuclear weapons similar to the question of the use of guns? Gun owners argue that guns don't kill, people do. But when people have guns, more people die. Um, yeah, I don't know that I have any real wisdom to share on that. I mean, obviously, bombs in and of themselves don't kill anybody. You have to drop the bomb or launch the bomb or whatever. Um, uh, maybe it's a question of scale. I don't know. Uh, but clearly, uh, the gun itself is not the issue. But but obviously, there's a history of... Uh, more guns, more people dying from guns. And, and here we are between the United States and, uh, and the UK with me and Rabbi Rafi. Uh, those statistics, I think, are pretty clear that, that uh, we have more guns in the United States per capita and more people die from, from guns. Yeah, it's, 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 it's totally disingenuous, this whole lot. I mean, for Brits, we just think you're all mad. I've got to be honest. It's complete, it's complete madness for us. It's completely disingenuous. But the language is the key, which we're looking at here, Julia, Julie, which is that we try and separate the two issues. Oh, ones, but you can't. That's the point about the great partnership. There is the scientific ability, the physical ability to build something, and then the moral ethical responsibility um, of what you do with it. And you have to care about both. And the gun lobby, by saying, oh, guns don't kill real people, that's not our issue. It's disingenuous, dishonest, and frankly, fundamentally immoral. You have to join the two things together. And it's wrong to do that. And that's what we've been doing in our conversations here. They are, they are, it's a partnership. It's not one or the other. And you can say, I'm just involved in my area. I, I think there's actually good coming out of the movie uh, Oppenheimer that stimulates discussion about uh, nuclear weapons that probably has not uh, been taking place at the same level of intent that, uh, that it warrants. Uh, and I'm not trying to weigh in on that, but uh, just to say that, again, to pretend that those arguments shouldn't be conducted is, is wrong. Rona Berger asks, are the biblical examples of God's actions against Sodom and Gomorrah uh, and the, the Egyptians moral cases of collective punishment or rather matters of political necessity? And is that question relevant to the question of using the bomb? Uh, that's a great question. And hello, Rona. It's wonderful. Uh, I remember meeting you. Yeah, you're a wonderful philosopher, and I'm reading through your book at the moment. Um, it's a great question. Um, uh, the reason I definitely think it's a moral issue, not just uh, expediency, because it's because of the way Abraham responds to God. Will the, will the judge of all the earth not act justly? So it's definitely seen as a moral question. Um, but the political necessity is a is a great question, and and you could argue in the Bible that that's often why these why God's making these decisions. Um, uh, but it's difficult as far as moderns to read that and understand that. And a, a key issue, and I'd love to know what you think about this, Rowan, and maybe we can email about it. Is the um, the issue of in the ancient world, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but I've I've been thinking about this a lot, and I don't know, Bob, I you think about this as well. Is that um, the, the idea of the individual? individual independent free choice is modern in the ancient world uh, uh the, the slaves or the or the members of uh, egyptian society didn't see themselves as having a right to do what they wanted they were under the rule of the pharaoh and if the pharaoh said do something they would do it they weren't autonomous and therefore they were a collective individualism is a modern phenomenon and therefore to see them as a group and punish them as the group which is what the torah does makes sense in the modern world, post-individualism, it's a different thing. People can be conscientious objectors, can be dissenters, would have thought of doing that, which wouldn't have happened back then. And therefore, it's fundamentally morally different. Um, that, that, that's how I see it in terms of related to the ancient world and the modern world. And you know, in, in our cinema, you know, we, 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 we generalize. You know, in Lord of the Rings, there are no good orcs. Okay, um, you know, and in the original Star Wars movie, you know, all the um, all the stormtroopers were were all evil. What's interesting is in the modern versions of the the remake of the Star Wars, you suddenly have a stormtrooper take his helmet off and he's got a face, and this is kind of the reboot of Star Wars or the maturing of kind of action movies of like actually you know, there's more complexity, right? All the baddies aren't bad, 
and all the goodies aren't good. And what do you do about that? You know, Harry Potter debates it with, you know, Slytherin. Are they evil? Or actually it turns out that you need a bit of Slytherin in you to be good and how you balance the two issues. So it, it, for me, it's the change in ancient, the ancient or the idealistic world or a fiction or the ancient world of, uh, of um, the collective versus modern individualism. Uh, that, that, that's, that's my response. Um, I think you've touched on something that may be a little bit uh, far afield from Oppenheimer, but the tension that exists between, I'll speak to American individualism and Jewish collective uh, responsibility, that tension is still with us today very much. I think uh, we live in a country where the individual has all sorts of rights and privileges and the collective is maybe suppressed. Um, Judaism is more nuanced, I would say, yes. on this. Yes, well, we, 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 ours is the move from rights to responsibilities. You know, as one of your great presidents said, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. It's about responsibilities in Judaism. We have individuality because we have individual responsibility to fix and help this world. Um, so rights, it, it's, rights always feels like I can do what I want without any moral responsibility that goes with it. And that's a mistake. So we, ha we have responsibilities, not rights in Judaism. I think that's the, the easiest way of saying it. I'll just share a quote from an excellent biography about Oppenheimer, which was not the basis for the movie. This is a book by uh, Monk, Ray Monk. Um, he says that Oppenheimer cannot be understood without taking into account the importance of his deeply felt desire to overcome the sense of being an outsider that he inherited from his German Jewish background. This desire lies at the root of the ambivalence toward his Jewish ancestry that was noted by many of his closest friends and at the root of what Einstein perceptively described as Oppenheimer's unrequited love for the US government. So Ooh. here's an individual who's as fervently American uh, and, and support, patriotic, if you will, as you can be, but his Judaism was not something he was so comfortable with. No, and fascinatingly, the way the, the film presents it is his morality told him that at the end. And that whole big uh, hub of the private conversation he has with Albert Einstein, which is what the movie is all about, is Albert telling him that, you know, they'll give you an award at the end because they'll feel guilty, but they'll never really accept you. Mm -hmm. right? And, uh, and it's, it's an older man telling a younger man at the very beginning, this is what it's going to be. So the, the, uh, the, uh, the kind of pretense of the movie is that since he'd had that conversation, oh, Jack, think about it. That means that Oppenheimer always, in the way the movie does it, always knew that deep down. Always wanted it, but knew it couldn't happen. Mm -hmm. you, you can't escape. It's like, no, Jonah, you can't escape this, this Jewishness. But what got him, ultimately, the way I look at it, is not his Jewish cultural heritage, but his essential morality, which the bomb put into the front face. And he had to actually end up being the moral voice. And by Sachs, my teacher always said that Jews were not the only ones, but we've always been the counter voice in the conversation of man, of humankind, of the moral voice of saying, but is this right? And ironically, this Oppenheimer ran away from his Judaism ends up being the Jew on the front page of newspapers making that moral statement. Um, you, you have to think that God has a sense of humor for that to, for that to have happened. You have to, you have to. Uh, Judith Kay asked a question directly to, to Jack, and she says, you seem to be suggesting that one of the things that separated Oppenheimer and, and Strauss was the gap between ethical humanism and ethical monotheism, and that Strauss' involvement with the religion somehow helped him to square in the moral dile dilemmas that faced them. Might I suggest that Oppenheimer's struggle with the moral and ethical ambiguities is, in and of itself, absolutely characteristic of being Jewish, while considering the issue of religion? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I think that is the heart of Judaism, that we don't take simple answers and that we are, we are look, we are named after uh, an individual who struggles with God, right? That's where we get our name. And uh, as Israel, um, I think that's what Oppenheimer is doing through his moral questioning of things. Um, but I think he still was a little uncomfortable with his Jewishness in a way that didn't help him as an integrated human being. I think that was the point I was trying to make. David Shulman brings up the question of um, that in the end, and, and uh, Truman makes this very clear, 
that the the dropping of the bomb was a decision that Truman made. The ethical dilemma isn't that more of a Truman issue than an Oppenheimer issue. And maybe beyond just the two of them, too. I mean, I don't think it's it's not fair for us today to say the bad guy is this person or the bad guy is that person. I mean, we face ethical issues on these topics today. And so maybe the important thing is that we have a collective responsibility to uh, struggle with these issues, like what we are doing with this discussion uh, yeah. that you've arranged, Ron. As well, like Jack mentioned, you know, there were some people who walked out, you know, of, of, of Los Alamos. If they'd done a mass walkout, there wouldn't be a choice for Truman to make. Let's see, we have another question. Is there a, um, any rationale for thinking that collective punishment of Germans was more morally acceptable than collective pu punishment of the Japanese, uh, who also had a record of being, um, in, in, in quotes in the comment here, being brutally humane? Well, it, it, we're talking about soldiers here. Well, so Shimon Nagasaki was on a civilian population. Are we saying that's true about the uh, the mothers and, and, and the children? Is that what we're saying? Um, you know, there's, there's a fundamental moral challenge to here, which is independent of, of how bad your enemy is, if you're, if you're killing civilians, because then it's just about general society. Um, I want to mention just one pasuk, which people might not know about um, in the Torah. It's in chapter 13 of uh, Deuteronomy, where it's talking about wiping out an immoral city. And it does talk about those things. The, the, the Torah says, when there were idolatrous cities, as well as you're allowed to wipe it out, if God said... But there's an amazing verse there which shows that there's a, a feeling of a moral problem here. The verse says that God says that, that you've got to listen to God's voice, Lishma Mitzvotav, to listen to his commandments, which I'm commanding to you. And he says, and I will give you mercy, and I will be merciful to you and make you successful. And there's a double mention of mercy. So what's this mercy? So one is the mercy is that I will help you conquer the land of Israel. But what does it mean I'll give you rachamim? And this is an amazing commentary of the um, I found this in a, in a, of the of the of the Or Chaim oh, by Jack. You'll like this. He says that the act of us, even though it's morally right, because God told us to wipe out this people, it will affect us emotionally and make us be less moral by having done the act. So God will do a miracle and rebuild mercifulness inside the the, the Jewish soul, even after they've done this. It's an amazing point. What it means is, and whether you take this literally or not, it means that divinely sanctioned violence is allowed, murder, but you know what? It hurts you. It's like what Golda Meir said um, about uh, enemies within Israel. He said, I can forgive you for attacking us. I can't forgive you for, us ma for making us kill you. Because what does it do to us by having done this moral action? It sullies you. So therefore, God commanded it, but God will do a miracle and rebuild your moral morality inside you, which is admission that if God didn't, without a miracle, we wouldn't. And that doing this act always morally compromises you, even if it can be justified. It will morally compromise you as a human being. And that is a question that there is no black and white answer to. You have to live with that reality. And that's what I think Robert Oppenheimer was living with. Even if he could argue it was justified, and apparently every year, I heard this great podcast, every year when he was, you know, it's hard in these islands that he was at, he had a party on the day of the, they dropped the bomb, that, that, that he still recognised, look what I achieved. But at the same time, he had a moral quandary that, is this right? And you have to live with that. Even if it's justified, it morally compromises you, it sullies you. Um, and that's a reason to always consider, is it justified? Is it, is it, or is it, is it, it's not fully human to do that. I think uh, those who um, participate in battles uh, suffer from PTSD in part because there is some moral compromise involved. Uh, people mm -hmm. do things that they may not be so comfortable with after the fact. Uh, that doesn't mean that they didn't do the right thing, but, but obviously there's no easy answers here. Right, right. And there's that there's that very powerful moment where where remember, there's a whole debate whether there's a danger that they will by making the atom bomb that they will ignite the atmosphere and destroy the world even that's a very small chance, and the irony they do in the film is that Albert that, that Albert Einstein says is that is that possible and Oppenheimer says, talking morally now maybe actually you know what by doing this we are destroying the world, mm -hmm. not physically with the bomb but the moral the moral fabric right. of society it's the ultimate challenge. But humans really have the ability of that free choice given to us in the Garden of Eden. And it, they, the weight is bigger than ever before. 
human responsibility and therefore the need for religious and moral compasses is more than any other time in history. David Raphael asks, is there a parallel between the rush to develop atomic weapons in order to beat and intimidate the, the Germans, the Russians, uh, whoever, and the current rush to develop artificial intelligence out of China? In both cases, moral issues and controlling the technology are secondary to being the first to develop it. That's a good question. That's what they're saying. Uh, but the reason we have to go forward on AI because China's doing it anyway. So my argument is always the same, which is that there's a both sides have to have moral responsibilities of what they're going to do, of, of what they're going to do about these issues, and sit and try and sit down and talk about it. Uh, again, to quote Winston Churchill, he said, and this is a man who fought more wars than anybody. He said, "Jaw, jaw, not war, war." Jaw, jaw. We need to talk. We need to find ways of talking. I uh, need voices to, to 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 have this conversation. Maybe that's naive, and there is. I mean, look, the pursuit of artificial intelligence isn't essentially immoral in the same way that developing a bomb is i mean it might be irresponsible <laughs> and we should analyze that um but it's a, it's a very different thing in that sense but the the, the 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 feel the need to keep up with the enemy is in terms of escalation uh is an interesting it's an interesting question in that sense by the way. You, you've uh, inspired me in in your wonderful remarks today uh rabbi that uh, i should think about uh, jewish sources as well and so I'm, I'm reminded that it is a central premise of Judaism that people are made in God's image. And it doesn't say males, and it doesn't say Jewish people, and it doesn't say whites, uh, and it doesn't say all sorts of things. It says people. And I think the idea of breaking down barriers and humanizing the other is very important. This talking that you alluded to with Winston Churchill that goes a long way because it's hard to hate the person that you realize is also a person. I think the issue about the Nazis versus the Japanese, there undoubtedly was a piece of racism involved in that too, because the Japanese, that's a different kind of people. We don't really connect to that. It's not such a moral issue like it would be with Europeans, perhaps. But mm. really, we need to we need to recognize that we're all human. And the more we we are able to relate to the other, the less likely we are to dehumanize them. Amen. Amen. Rabbi Dove Gartenberg, uh, Gartenberg um, makes poses this question. Uh, the Rabbi said of Oppenheimer, he was full of too many humanities. Quote, um, what is the blindness of pluralism? Did it did it blind Oppenheimer? Um, so it is true that Robbie was critical of Oppenheimer and says that uh, he would have been better off um, studying the Talmud than studying the Bhagavad Gita, for example, uh, that he was delving into too many subjects. I don't know about the ethical aspects of Rabbi Dove's question, um, but I will say that Oppenheimer worked as a physicist in an era where people were making amazing breakthroughs at pretty great frequency. Quantum mechanics really changed our understanding of the universe. And you could ask the question, why did Oppenheimer not win a Nobel Prize? And some people have been critical of his ability to stay focused on a problem long enough to actually carry it to completion because he had such a diverse spectrum of interests that he would hop from one thing to another. I think the Nobel Prize winning Jewish physicist Murray Gelman said that Oppenheimer did not have Zitzfleisch. He couldn't stay parked on one topic and he would just flip from one thing to another. And that probably deterred him from achieving the greatness he could have achieved with the brilliance that he had as a physicist. He couldn't stay focused on anything. So uh, again, uh, delighted to hear that Rabbi Dove is joining us. Um, and I don't know if that answers the question, but that's what my understanding is about Oppenheimer's diverse interests. There's a question here that, that um, I was curious about, and I see it's coming from uh, from uh, uh, Peter Zandon and Alan Nutwitz, and it has to do with the fact that you are rabbis and physicists. Um, can you comment, uh, Rabbi Rafi, you comment 
partly on this earlier, um, but uh, could you comment about your perception of your relationship between what does being a physicist mean to you being a rabbi? And how the yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm a big follower of Einstein on these issues, um, who believe that the two went hand in hand. But there's a wonderful book called uh, The Penultimate Curiosity, um, which, uh, which I read. And it talks about that the, the question that originally the questions of humankind were solved, what rather the attempt to understand who we are, where we come from, what is the nature of existence, what's our purpose, self, self aware issues, which, you know, uh, us, you know, bipeds, Homo sapiens began to think, which which other animal species don't contemplate. Uh, I'm not going to argue not at all. There may be some kind of mind in monkeys and dolphins, but in terms of serious human reflection, it's a human reflection. And originally, those questions were answered by religion, and religion gave us the source for that. Gradually, we started actually finding scientific responses. So when we were, when we thought about that it was gods that brought the sun up every day, we began to realize no, there might be forces. So actually, the original questions that became the source for scientific investigation were religious. But it ended up being that realized that science could solve those. And therefore, they, they've always gone hand in hand through history. And it's a mistake to understand them as, as a contradiction. And, and for me, it's, it's a way of it's a language that many people have said. It's about God's words and God's works. God's works is physical reality, the planets, the space, our earth, everything that we physically have. Those are God's works and God's words of the Torah. How can they contradict? They're both from the same author. The author is the creator. And therefore, if we see a contradiction, we've misunderstood something. We've misunderstood. And actually, it's actually a great response. To it. It's a whole halakhic debate, an 11th century uh, commentary about this, where some rabbi solves a problem, a mathematical problem in, in, in a, it's not a mathematical problem, it's a problem about plants and fruits, it's to do with all our and, and measuring, and he solves it by saying, well, if we say Pythagoras' theorem doesn't apply to, um, applies to squares, but not to rectangles, then, 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 then I can make it work. Another commentary goes, what are you talking about? You can't ignore maths, that's what it is, it's just wrong, you don't understand it, Don't you can't just do that, you can't say it doesn't apply. So even back in the medieval period, the rabbis that knew science and understood that, that, you know, you can't ignore scientific reality. You have to take this science and understand and look for God underneath that and how the two come together. And if you see a contradiction, you're either misunderstanding religion or you're misunderstanding science. And so for me, I thank my lucky stars, to, as I learned from Einstein, that, um, that I have both, that I've, I've, I've trained to do both because it really both helped me understand the other. Both really have. And Maimonides says, if you want to know the nature of a relationship with God, look at reality, look at the complexity of reality. And if you're not shocked and in awe of it, then, then, then uh, you know what? I'll read you the quote from Einstein. This is the line from Einstein. He says it beautifully. He says, um, I'll, qu I'll quote you. Let me just find it briefly. Here's what Einstein says. On it. He said, the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mysterious. It is, it is a, the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead, a snuffed out candle. To sense that behind anything that can be experienced, there is something that our minds cannot grasp, whose beauty and sublimity reaches us only indirectly, this is religiousness. In this sense, and in this sense only, I'm a devoutly religious man. That's what Albert Einstein wrote. I would just say briefly that I too feel quite blessed to have been able to combine uh, a passion for science with a passion for Judaism. And our hope, uh, which we never expressed explicitly at the beginning of this, but our hope uh, that Rabbi Rafi and I had is that everybody listening to this program will want to go out to become physicists and rabbis. It's the best combination you can have. <laughs> There's a comment here. Uh, Roger de, de Freitas uh, says, will this discussion be repeated? I would truly like to listen to it again. All I can say about this is, wow. And I think this uh, gives the expression for many people who've been listening to the program today. And I want to thank the two of you for this stimulating discussion and exploration of Judaism and ethics in such a, a major issue as 
what we see before us now with the attention that Oppenheimer is, is receiving. This has certainly been a pleasure. And I want to thank you very much, Rabbi Dr. Raphael Zarum, Rabbi Dr. Jack Schlachter. Thank you for being here with the Santa Fe Distinguished Lecture Series. And uh, we welcome you back. And maybe we can choose another subject for another discussion at another time. This would be wonderful. Thank you. Right, thank you so much. Be well.